Amen. Okay. Well, thank you guys for joining me on my last sermon. Honestly, it means so much to me. Um, excuse me if I cough. I'm still getting over sickness. But again, I'm so grateful that you guys are here. So I'm actually going to turn to Micah 6, verses 1 through 8. So if you have a Bible, you want to turn there, you can. If not, I'm going to read it right now. And it says, Listen to what the Lord is saying. Stand up and state your case against me. Let the mountains and hills be called to witness your complaints. And now, O oh mountains, listen to the Lord's complaint. He has a case against his people. He will bring charges against Israel. O oh my people, what have I done to you? What have I done to make you tired of me? Answer me. For I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to help you. Don't you remember, my people, how, the, how King Balak of Moab tried to curse you and how Balaam, son of Beor, blessed you instead? And remember your journey from Acadia Grove to Gial, when I, the Lord, did everything I could to teach you about my faithfulness. What can we bring to the Lord? Shall we bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow before God most high with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him a thousand rams and ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? No, O oh people. The Lord has called you to what is good. And this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Let us pray. Dear Father, God, thank you um, for just bringing us together, Lord, today to um, just hear what you have to say in our lives and just to just learn more about you and the history um, of your people, God. You're a just God, and we love you so much. Amen. So, <clears throat> I'm going to title this sermon, Oh Great One, and um, I brought this title about because I just saw the new Aladdin. How many of you guys have seen it yet? Okay. Are you heard it? Okay, I was kind of iffy too when I saw this, and I think everyone knows Rob Williams is like really hard to replace as Genie. So, I had my doubts, but I will say I give it like an 8 out of 10. 8 out of 10, maybe 7.5 out of 10, but it's around that, like, it's pretty good. Um, you guys are probably wondering why I called it all this sermon, a great one, and I'm talking about Aladdin, but it's because, first off, I just saw that yesterday, so it's on my mind, but also, both stories, fictional and biblical, are stories about justice and judgment. So, in Aladdin, right, and if you haven't seen the new one, had to see the Disney one. I hope you have, because it's a great film. Um, you see injustice is done within the rich community and also the poor community. And it's the exact same when we're reading chapter 6 of Micah. We see the prophet Micah, which if you guys don't know, prophets were appointed by God to deliver a message to um, different people of nations. So in this case, Israel. God wanted a message to be delivered to Israel, so Micah, Micah is that prophet. Um, but he was sent during the time when Israel and Judah were overwhelmed by Assyrian military invasions. So this is a time when there's a lot of warfare going on, and a lot of the invasions, they started in 734 BC and lasted to 701 BC, so it's a good chunk of time. And during this time, though, there were a lot of religious um, and political leaders that were using their vocation and their positions um, for business careers, basically. So they were abusing their powers. There was a lot of idolatry going on. And before Israel and Judah were getting threatened by this, Samaria actually was invaded because of the same exact reasons. So now, Micah is bringing this case to Israel to be like, this is a perfect example. We don't want you to get invaded as well. But besides that rich history, um, 
One thing that I really found amazing when I was studying this chapter was the tone and the language that Mr. was telling people. Uh, this language is more so like a lawsuit, if, um, if that makes any sense. It's a very lawyer-esque, I know that's not a word, but I just made it a word, lawyer-esque. Um, and it actually correlates throughout Micah from chapters one to three because there is a lot of accusations of injustice, um, there's courtroom imagery, uh, so there's a lot of issues that he has with this country right now and this nation, so that's what he's focusing on. But besides that, in the text, uh, besides foreshadowing what is going to happen to Israel, there's also a beautiful um, last declaration, which is verse 8, where it's talking about how God still yearns for them to change their ways, to have that relationship with God, to walk humbly, and to love kindness, which we're going to get a little bit into later on. Um, so I'm right now in a movie, TV show kind of stage, so the best way I can talk about how we're going to review this is if you guys have seen the movie Suits or Law and Order or any of those, I want to apply it to analyzing Micah 6 because it can be very confusing to an audience. So in any courtroom, right, language is very powerful. Um, word choices are on purpose, phrases are on purpose, lawyers pick apart that um, all the time. So that's what we're going to do with Micah, because there's some words or some phrases that I think are important for us to grasp to understand a bigger message. So first, let's start with verse 1 and 2. He, he says, listen. Um, so he's calling them to listen, which is like a bold declaration of saying, hey, this is important, this is an important message. Um, so it just shows that there's legal distribution um, like going on right now. So it's a red alert, this is something that we need to pay attention to. But he talks about the case that is against them, but he calls on to these mountains, which can be very confusing to readers of our day. We're like, what kind of mountains are you talking about? But after studying, still scholars can't decide. There's two, um, two different theories. One is that Micah is calling on the physical mountains that is around the scenery. The other one is that the mountains are meant to be as the nations of God. Either or though, um, whether it's the physical one or the nations, it just shows the vastness of um, the importance of this lawsuit that is happening. Um, the importance of God's power and what he has to say to his people. Which, in verse 3, he says, Oh, my people, what have I done to you? So this question, right, this woe that he's bringing about to his audience, uh, I want to hit that my people is very important because it shows that the Lord still cares for Israel, reminding them of the covenant that they were in this relationship that they had together, but now is broken. Which, in verse 4, it's just a beautiful, if you think it's like a beautiful river, it flows all together. So, first he talks about them being his people, but then in verse 4 he says, I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from slavery. I sent you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to help you. So, this is the Exodus story. He's talking about how he helped his people. He brought them up, redeemed them, and um, it's just always been there. So um, you, you just see this bigger picture growing, right? And then he gives more examples through 6 and 7. But as I told you in the beginning, we really wanted to focus on 8 as well because uh, this is the big message right here. Um, because they're asking how they should come to the Lord. And it's a lot of doing. If you see in 6 and 7, you talk about burnt offerings, offering their firstborn child. It's a lot of doing action, like if you're like paying an entrance fee somewhere. Um, but the Lord isn't requiring that of his people. And he says, No, O people, the Lord has told you what is good, which is to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And this, uh, this uh, love and mercy, it's, it's more than um, like mere kindness. It's a, the, the word love is the said that is used here. 
And that's like a steadfast love. So he's saying, you know, have this steadfast love for mercy. And also walk humbly with your God. So it's showing his devotion to Israel, even though right now they're in a time of strangling. So now that we picked apart some of, I think, the major key components so we can have this big grasp of what Micah is trying to say. You guys may be wondering, how does this even apply to me, though, in my life? Like, why am I studying these words? I think it's really important for us to know that we are all God's chosen people. And Israel was God's chosen nation. And he talks about the Exodus story of going through the wilderness and then him helping them settle in a new land. So it's reflecting that the Lord is a Lord of all creation, but also that we are all subject to accountability. Even God's favorite people were subject to accountability. So this primary action and claim is that God will not tolerate any injustice or oppression. Uh, Israel was doing it, and God had to send Micah to tell them, your ways are, are not right. You have to get your heart right. You have to get in check. And um, I think that applies to us. I mean, all of us here are members of this church, and we hear constantly that we are sinners. We've damaged other people, but people have also damaged us. And there's a lot of injustice in this world right now. We're not going to get into political affairs. We're not going to get into anything, but I do know that we are in Echo Park, Los Angeles, where there is a lot of times where we see lack of justice. I mean, shoot, um, we see it even across our street. Um, but it's also encouraging for Micah to know, from us to know that we shouldn't grow weary from it, and that God still favors us. We are his children, but we have to be accountable for each other and for ourselves.